Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to Calling on the Name of the Lord podcast. My name is Russ McCullough. I'm your host. I come to you on behalf of the Archdale Church of Christ in Charlotte, North Carolina. And we are excited that you are here. This podcast comes to you Tuesday through Friday at noon. And we explore scriptures regarding salvation and we ask the Bible questions, and we discover Bible answers together. And today we will be exploring one of the most important passages in the New Testament regarding salvation, and that is Romans chapter 6, 1 through 6. And so I encourage you to open your Bibles and look up that passage and It is our goal today and every day that we speak as the Bible speaks and remain silent as the Bible is silent, leave our opinions at the door, and see what the Scripture says that we should do for faith and practice. We desire to neither add to nor take away from the Word of God, and we want to be like the noble Bereans that the Bible says in the book of Acts that we're more noble than the Thessalonians in that they searched the scriptures daily to see whether or not these things were true. And so that is the challenge that I would like to pose to you today and every day that we come together for this podcast to check me out, to make sure that the things that are said here are consistent with the word of God. And please, by all means, if there's anything that we say here or assert here that is an error from what the scriptures say, please, by all means, let me know in the comment section so that we can make amends and change and learn and do better. Because we want to speak for God and not for ourselves. Uh, We are going to see what the Bible says, and we've already determined that the Bible is going to be on this podcast, our only source of truth. Uh, We're going to set aside any denominations that we might be affiliated with. We're going to set aside all creeds because they are nothing more than the work of men. We're going to set aside all catechisms, all manuals, all kinds of theories and speculations. We're going to set aside the theologians and the powerful thinkers of our age. All these things matter not. It's thus saith the Lord is going to be our standard, and we're going to look at these passages along those lights, uh, because the Bible only makes Christians only. There it is. And so last time we had for your edification, looked at the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, verse 1 following. We had left you yesterday with some questions, and we want to uh, repeat those questions and give answers. Now, if your answers are different from mine, by all means, uh, make note of that in the comment section so we can address it, because there cannot be multiple truths. There is only one truth singular. We need to discover what it is, and the Bible is there for us to do so. Now, here are the questions from yesterday that we posed to you. So we're going to go through these questions, and we're going to answer them. Number one, what did the Corinthians receive from Paul? 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, The answer is, they received the gospel that was preached to them by Paul, a singular gospel. Uh, Number two, what result came from this reception? Well, the Bible says in second, uh, excuse me, first Corinthians 15, that um, they stood and were being saved. That's what the result was. Question number three, Is salvation permanent without exception from this reception on? And the answer is no, because the operative word here is if. If is the operative word, unless they disbelieved 
in vain. So no matter, even if you were faithfully following everything the scripture said, but you didn't believe it to start with, it does you absolutely no good. But Paul is saying here that their salvation in which they were being saved, in which they stood, was predicated upon their continual faithfulness. That's why he used the word if. Number four, and question number four, what are the three components of the gospel according to this passage from the pen of Paul? Paul, who, of course, was an apostle, and he was inspired to write these words. They are from the Holy Spirit and without error. The three components of the gospel are, simply put, the death, number one, the burial, number two, and number three, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. These are the three components of the gospel. This is what constitutes, as we've said in other lessons on other occasions, this constitutes the liberty that Christ brought. It's the portal through which men may pass in order to be free from the law of sin and death. Now, um, number five, the final question from the passage is the death, burial, and resurrection, that is both, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, define the gospel is the question. Define the gospel. And I was giving you the, the answer before the before the question. That's not the way we do it. We ask the question and then give the answer. So the, the answer is the death, burial, and resurrection that is both preached and received in both faith and obedience that is then faithfully lived unto death. You see, faith without response is worthless. It's not faith. Uh, how can you say you have faith if you have no obedience to what you say you believe in? If I uh, tell you that there's $10,000 in your mailbox and you say, oh, I believe that, but then you never go out to the mailbox, how can you say you really believe it? Faith and response are required. And so this is what Paul is trying to say here, that there's components to this thing that we call the gospel. And so that brings us to our passage today. Our passage today, again, if you'll turn in your, your Bibles to Romans chapter 6, 1 through 6. I am uh, reading from the English Standard Version, just so you'll know. And here's what the Bible says, Romans 6, 1 through 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound. By no means, or as the King James says, God forbid. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him, in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we could would no longer be enslaved to sin. This is what Christ said he was going to do in Luke chapter 4. And before we go on, let's go back to Luke chapter 4 and see exactly what Christ said he was going to do when he came to begin his ministry. What is the ministry of Christ all about? Well, he tells us, as he told his friends and relatives and acquaintances and everybody that ever knew him down in Nazareth at the synagogue one Saturday. This is what uh, Christ said his mission was going to be. Uh, beginning with verse 16 of Luke 
chapter 4. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he, sat, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, quote, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to what? To proclaim good news to the poor, to proclaim the gospel. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives. The word liberty here is the same word that's translated in Acts 2.38, remission. Remission and liberty. Liberty and remission, same word, same concept, something to keep in mind. And recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That is what Christ said he was going to do. And that is what he did. So this liberty that Christ proclaims, this unleashing of freedom from the fear of death in Hades, how is it obtained? Well, we found out yesterday that the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So in order to be with him, we must as it were, participate with him in his death, participate with him in his burial, and participate with him in his resurrection. And how just is that accomplished? Paul tells us here in this passage. This is how these two passages are intertwined. One cannot understand 1 Corinthians 15, unless one understands Romans 6 and vice versa. That's why the whole counsel of God needs to be explored, not just part of it. And every text has a brother or a sister. And so we have to explore the entire Bible for the truth. And that's what we're doing here on this, this podcast, this Calling Upon the Name of the Lord podcast. We're exploring various and to a knowledge of the truth so we can all be obedient to this gospel so that we all can be one with Christ. Because that's what the whole idea of life is all about. Not to be frivolous with our life, not to waste it, not to just wander through it like some random journey somewhere, but to make sure that when we get to the end of this thing that we call life, we will be with the Lord and not without him. No one wants to be without the Lord because there's only one place where the Lord won't be in eternity, and that's in hell. He will not be there. We certainly don't want to be there without Christ. We want to be with Christ in heaven with the Father and the Spirit and the saints of all ages. Amen. So here is the passage. This is how we participate in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ to be one with him. So he begins uh, with a question. What shall we say then? What shall we say then? Well, this is a reference to what he's just completed in chapter 5, uh, verse uh, 19, beginnings. For, as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, he's referring back to Adam, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. He's contrasting uh, Adam in Christ. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where the sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through the righteousness leading to what? Eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. How do we partake in this eternal life through Jesus Christ? He then answers it. He answers that question in Romans 6, 1 through 6. So he asks again for emphasis sake. Remember now that Romans 5 and Romans 6, well, that partition didn't, it wasn't there to start with. It was added by some man 500 years ago. But in the original letter, there was no no break here. So he says, well, what shall we say then? What, what are we going to say to this eternal life through Jesus Christ? What are we going to say? What are we going to say about this? 
And then he asked a rhetorical question. As we've mentioned before, we'll mention again, the rhetorical question is a question that has the answer already embedded in it. We, we hear the question, oh, we automatically know the answer. So he asked this rhetorical question. Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? No. No. God forbid, no. We would never do that. We don't want to continue in sin because that is where death and Hades are. We don't want any part of that. So we're going to say, absolutely, we don't want to um, stifle God's grace in any way. We don't want to sin more so there'll be more grace necessary. That would be uh, tricking God or tempting God, which of course you can't do such a thing, but men do try. He says, by no means. And then he gives a reason why the answer is so obvious. He says, how are we going to live in what we've already died to? When we were baptized, we died to, to this thing called sin. How, how are we now going to go back and live in what we've already died to? It's not right. It's not possible for a faithful Christian to want to do such a thing. Only an apostate who's committing spiritual suicide would contemplate going back to live in sin that he'd already died to. So he goes on. And he just builds on this whole idea, the absurdity of Christians wanting to go back into sin. How crazy is that? Verse 3, do you not know that all of us, I want to stop here. Do you not know that all, how many are left out of all? None. And when he's speaking of us, who is he speaking to? The us refers to, obviously, the writer, Apostle Paul, and the entire Church of Christ in the city of Rome that he's writing to. Romans chapter 1, verse 7 clearly states he's writing to the saints that are in Rome. So, all the saints that are in Rome, plus Paul, constitutes the word us in this verse. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into what? Into his death. Uh, this baptism is no, um, what is it they say? Uh, outward sign of an inward grace, some kind of ritual, uh, nebulous, real foggy, jello -y kind of concept. No. When we're baptized, we're baptized straight into the death of Christ. When we're baptized, we die. We die. The old man of sin is killed, and then he's buried. That's what he says. We're baptized into his death. This is, this is a serious business. Now, just to mention the reverse of this. If one is not baptized, he's not into the death of Christ. You can't get into the death of Christ unless you're baptized into the death of Christ. And if you're not dead with Christ, guess what? You can't be buried with Christ because live folks don't get buried. I, I remember the old uh, the joke, you may have heard of it, that um, uh, there was a plane crash right on the border between Canada and the United States. And the question is, where did they bury the survivors? Well, they didn't. You don't bury survivors, you bury dead folk. So it was a trick question. But seriously, uh, only people who die to the love and practice of sin get buried with Christ. This is what we call repentance. You can't get buried until you're dead. And if you haven't been buried, that means only one thing, you're still alive in your sins, and that is where you don't want to be. 
Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized in Christ were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. Why? Why is this all going on? In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. This is all a package. If you want to repent of your sins and be done with your sins and have your sins remitted to have liberty, then what must be done? You must die to sin. And when you're died, you're dead, and then the dead are buried. So we die with Christ. We're buried with Christ. Why? So we can be raised with Christ. He was raised to eternal glory, and we will be raised to a new life so that we can have eternal glory when we join the dead on the other side of Jordan, so to speak, uh, as a metaphor. But when we die, we will go to one of two places. As Jesus clearly teaches, we will go to either, uh, un unless the Lord returns first. If the Lord doesn't return first, when we die, we go to either a place of torment, and be with the rich man, or we'll go to a place of comfort, Abraham's bosom, where we'll be um, with Lazarus. And so these are the two places where dead folks go. And But if you've been buried with Christ in baptism, you will have the opportunity, if you are faithful, to go to that place of comfort and be comforted in Abraham's bosom by Father Abraham and all the saints. So this is where we want to go as we await judgment because uh, Hades is the realm of the dead and the dead that are in Hades now are awaiting the day of judgment. On the day of judgment, on the last day, then all who have lived will come out of the grave and their bodies will be resurrected and their souls will be united. They will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And as Paul says to the Corinthians, that each man, every man, will give an account to the judgment seat of Christ to give an account for all the deeds done in the flesh, whether they be good or whether they be evil. Therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. And that's what we're doing here on this podcast, this time that we have Tuesday through Friday at noon that we refer to as calling upon the name of the Lord. And the idea is, the concept is, that I, that what we want is for you not to go to judgment unprepared. When you have to give that account, you want to be able to say, Yes, I did these things, but I am in Christ, and I have been forgiven and remitted of my sins, and I am in Christ. And then Christ will say, because of the fact that our name is written in the book of life, and that we're in him, if we've been found faithful on that day, he will say these words to us that we all long to hear. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you rule over many things. Enter into the joys of your Lord. Don't you want to hear those words? I do. That's why we're here today. So, going back to uh, the text. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. I want to be in the Christ resurrection on the last day. I don't want to be in the satanic resurrection on the last day because I know what will await me. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be what enslaved to sin. No one wants to hear these words these days. It's so 
politically incorrect to talk about slavery, but guess what? The truth is that all men are slaves. You and I are either slaves to Satan and sin, or we're slaves to Christ and liberty. Christ said he came to be a liberator. To emancipate us from the slavery of sin. I don't know about you, dear friend. I am so thankful I've been liberated and made free by the gospel of Jesus Christ. I was baptized when I was 14 in Newport News, Virginia. I remember it was like yesterday. Just as I am was the invitation song, and I went forward that Sunday night, was immersed into Christ by Brother Oscar McCoy at Newport News Church of Christ, and it was January the 3rd, 1965. I was 14 years old. Now you know how old I am. Uh, sorry about that, but it is what it is. And ever since that time, I have been in Christ. And by the grace and the mercy of Christ, I will remain there if I'm faithful until the end of my days. No matter what happens. Up to and including death itself, I intend by his grace and mercy to remain faithful. So that on that last day, I will hear those words that I long to hear and you long to hear. Enter into the joys of thy Lord. That's what we are awaiting. But my friends, it's not possible to hear those words if we don't die to sin and be buried with Christ in the watery grave and rise up to walk a new life. Because that's what puts us in Christ. We'll talk more about that as time goes on. But again, this is Calling Upon the Name of the Lord podcast coming to you from Charlotte, North Carolina. My name is Russ McCullough. Uh, this podcast is sponsored by the Archdale Church of Christ in Charlotte. We're located at 2525 Archdale Drive. And we invite you, if you're well, have no symptoms of illness of any kind, and uh, free of the virus, if you meet those criteria, we really want to encourage you to worship with us on Lord's Day morning in the parking lot of the Archdale Church of Christ at 11 a.m. Uh, we have seating that's six feet apart. Uh, we have secured, individually sealed communion uh, emblems. We wear our facial coverings to protect ourselves and others. We do everything we can to give a safe environment so that we can uh, render worship to Christ because Christ told the woman at the well in John chapter 4 that God is seeking us to worship him. So we're going to worship him in spirit and in truth on Lord's Day 11 should time continue and should still. We want you to be there with us, so we invite you. We'll continue to do so as well. Now, if you have questions about anything that has been said here today, please leave your comments in the comments section, and we'll address those questions and concerns uh, tomorrow at noon, Lord willing, here on Calling on the Name of the Lord. Have a great afternoon. Mm -hmm.